We are going to be talking today about periodontal risk assessment in general and in particular about face contrast microscopy as an in-office test for periodontal risk, which I uh, like to compare to what I call notched metal sticks, the contemporary technology. But first, let's review a little bit about how the profession got to where we are and the prevalence of the disease and the etiology on which microbiological assessment depends. In order to have disease, you need to have two factors. You first must have pathogenic bacteria in your mouth. You can't have disease without it. You must also have what used to be called the susceptible host, a term I loathe because it implies that some people are more susceptible to the disease than others. But we know that 75% of the population has some form of periodontal disease, according to the most recent NHANES test. You don't have 75% of any population with a genetic defect that makes them, that presupposes them to a disease. So it's highly unlikely that, that the genetic component is that large. What we do have, though, is what I like to call a, a obliging host. And by that I mean somebody who lets these bacteria grow in their mouth. And so the combination of having the bacteria and letting them grow and forming mature biofilms in the mouth triggers an inflammatory response, and it is the inflammatory response that damages the tissue, not the bacteria directly. The pathogens in and of themselves do relatively little damage to the periodontia. So it's the immune response that does the damage, and that leads to the connective and bone tissue loss. So what are the differences between health and disease? Healthy microflora is largely composed of gram-positive organisms, aerobic organisms, few white blood cells. Remember, the white blood cells are the inflammatory cells, so you should have a relatively low number of those if the patient is healthy. Absence, total absence of spirochetes. <clears throat> and it's largely a non-modal field. Very few modal types of bacteria are in healthy mouths. On the other hand, oops, amplifying that, these are the organisms that are typically seen in healthy mouths. You don't need to know the names of them, just know that they're gram-positive aerobes for the most part. I said few white blood cells, and that is the hallmarker of an absence of inflammation. No spirochetes whatsoever and a non-modal population. Disease, on the other hand, is characterized by a gram-negative microflora. Gram-negative is just a broad way of classifying half of all the bacteria into two camps. About half of known bacteria will stain for gram stain, and about the other half don't. They are anaerobic organisms. And let me clarify the term anaerobic because we find it's largely misunderstood by most people. Anaerobic bacteria are not killed by oxygen. That's a common misunderstanding. What microbiologists mean when they use the term is that they grow best when there is very little oxygen about. So anaerobic bacteria grow fastest in an anaerobic environment, but they're not necessarily killed by exposure to oxygen. And if you think of it, that would be a horrible way to, to transmit yourself from one host to another if mere exposure to the air, the oxygen in the air, killed you. They can survive uh, air for quite some time. Many white blood cells, when you have periodontal disease, whoops. Oh, we're back, okay. Um, Many white blood cells, because these are the inflammatory cells. Many spirochetes, often too numerous to count. And in general, the other bacteria that you see in infections are highly modal. They're capable of moving about within the sample. These are the three organisms that are characterized as the most periodontopathic, the so-called red group, composed of Porphyrmonas gingivalis, PG for short, Tanarilla forsythus, and Treponema species. There are 57 species of spirochetes that can live in the mouth, all pathogenic. Uh, some are early insect organisms, early colonizers. Others appear later in the process when conditions are much more anaerobic. But these are the ones that are, are the hot ones. In addition, you can have gram-negative facultatives. These are bugs that live with a little bit of oxygen. Complete gram-negative anaerobes. 
and positive facultative organisms, and fungi. Fungi in and of themselves, like uh, yeast organisms, can provoke inflammation. But the overall uh, characteristics are lots of spirochetes, lots of motility, and lots and lots and lots of white blood cells. How many bac bacteria are in the mouth? Current estimates range from 500, well, now it's closer to 800 to 1,000 different species. Not all present at the same time, of course. At any one time, you only have about one to 200 of those species in any given individual's mouth at any given time. These bacteria are highly adapted to their environment. And they have what we call niche ecosystems. So you'll find a different flora inhabiting the teeth, the gums, the mucosa, the tongue, and even different sides of a single tooth will have their own specialized microflora. You can find one set of bugs growing on the lingual side of an incisor and a completely different set, well, not completely, but a, a markedly different set of bacteria living on the facial aspect of the same tooth. They are that highly adapted to their particular environments. Don't use the word Pat plaque anymore. That's, that's passe. What is plaque? It could be anything. Last night's pizza, microbes, whatever. It's a nonspecific term, overused, nonspecific. Let's just get it out of our vocabulary. The word we're looking for is this living combination of organisms on the surface of the teeth that is a biofilm. And you're seeing this word more and more in all kinds of literature. They're, they're, they're pervasive in nature. Any place that you have communities of bacteria, they tend to get, aggregate into biofilms. So, what are biofilms? These are formerly independently living bacteria that coaggregate together, form cooperative communities, alter their gene expression when they're in these communities to activate functions that are possible in a community that are not possible as individuals. So, they're much more effective uh, as, as organisms and their growth patterns and ability to infect sites as biofilms than as planktonic organisms, which are what we call singletons. In, in biofilms, they use most of their genetic potential. As singletons, very little of their genetic potential. And this accounts for their amazing ability to change their environments to their advantage and to uh, avoid detection and destruction by our own immune systems. So biofilms initially form on pristine teeth super gingerly, and if they're allowed to continue to grow, they grow apically, congregate at the dental margin, and then begin to extend subgingivally down the side of the cementum. This is what a biofilm looks like with an electron photomicrograph. So you have generally filamentous forms being in the initial colonizers of the tooth surface, very rapid growers. They, in turn, are super colonized by cochoidal forms. As you see uh, the, these little bud-like organisms, they're growing completely around a filamentous stem. Small rods then colonize the cochoidal forms, and you build up these increasingly complex condominiums, if you will, of bacteria. Biofilms usually max out at about 36 microns. That's three times the diameter of a white blood cell. Why don't they get any thicker? Turns out it's curricular fluid flow is the problem there. To a bacterium, this slow wash of curricular fluid oozing out of the pocket is like a tsunami. It, it just wipes away anything that isn't very firmly attached. And you can only go up about three stories of bugs before things start getting loosely attached. And I have a little video of what that looks like for you, I think. Somewhere. Here we go. So this is a biofilm washing along the surface of a tooth under high magnification. And here is a magnified view of one individual clump. And you can see when the, when the length gets to be a certain point, they just fracture off moved to another site, found a new colony, and that's how biofilms grow and spread. How fast do bacteria grow? In a petri dish, under ideal conditions and ideal nutrients, they will double their numbers approximately, 
make sure I get the right number here. Oops, I'm ahead of myself. Well, it's approximately every uh, 14 minutes or so. Now, how fast does this occur? Within minutes of, say, having a prophy on a tooth, within minutes, the salivary pellicle, the proteins in your saliva, are redeposited onto the enamel surface. With one hour, just one hour, 60 to 90% of the tooth surfaces have already been recolonized by oral bacteria. That's how fast it happens. Within two hours, AA, actinomyces, predominates. By six hours, you have a fully mature biofilm. Now, this is supposing no interruption, no mechanical hygiene, nothing you know, being done to the, to the tooth. So it only takes six hours for a fully mature biofilm to form. If the bugs are present, that will do it in the patient's mouth. And this will be dominated by these species, which isn't important to know other than the fact that we're talking about the big three, the red group, spirochetes. So six hours is all it takes, theoretically. And I would pose the question to you, given how rapidly these bugs can repopulate, <laughs> since my reminder to drink at least once an hour, <laughs> uh, given how fast these bugs repopulate, where is your time best spent as a clinician in cleaning the patient's teeth? Are you going to go after ever decreasing amounts of calculus in the mouth, bearing in mind the fact that you can never eliminate all calculus in the mouth? No study has ever demonstrated you can remove all calculus. Despite that, we know that patients get better after root planing and scaling uh, the teeth. So clearly the tissues can bear some amount of calculus. It is the bacterial mass, the pathogenic bacterial mass, that triggers the disease process. So if you're going to spend another 15 minutes trying to get that last spicule of calculus, I submit that your time is much better spent training the patient in how to manage the growth of these biofilms on their teeth at home on a daily basis. That's where the rubber meets the road. How fast do oral bacteria grow in the mouth? Every, whoops, went too fast there. Every 4.8 hours, according to uh, a very clever uh, study that was done by Walter Loesch at the University of Michigan. So, in the course of a day, divide 24 hours by five, we get approximately five generations of new bacteria every 24 hours in the mouse. That's a logarithmic progression, two times two times two five times, two to the fifth in one 24-hour period. You all should know at this point, I'm sure, about the systemic disease associations with these bacteria. Every day, it seems like a new one comes out. I think a year from now, we'll probably find that every human disease is associated with the oral microflora. And there's evidence for causality now in oral spirochetes and Alzheimer's. So this is not mere associative data in, in some cases now. So what's the correlation? Why systemic disease is so tightly correlated with oral pathology? And that is inflammation. Once you have inflammation triggered in one part of the body, it sensitizes the immune system to look for uh, other problems in other places in the body. So once you have an oral infection, the likelihood of another infection being attacked by your immune system is heightened, and it's the attack of the immune system that seems to cause the damage. The genes are actually up and down regulated by the bacteria we're trying to eliminate. Our immune genes, let me say that again, are up and down regulated by the bugs we're trying to control. So, as I said, the bacteria do very little damage for themselves, but they trigger an immune response, and that produces the damage. 50% of it is passive, and 50% is active. The passive damage occurs because the body's first response to an infection is to send white blood cells to the site to 
gobble up phagocytose, the bad bacteria. And the body tries to do that in, in infections and in oral infections. So uh, an influx of white blood cells goes to the site of the infection. The problem is that the target bacteria have learned how to regulate the genes in our white blood cells. They upregulate the genes that are responsible for attracting white blood cells to the infection site. Now, you should have very quizzical expressions on your faces right now. Why would a pathogen want to attract white blood cells? I mean, these are the guys that are supposed to be gobbling them up, right? It turns out there's a sneaky reason for it. So they upregulate the attraction of the white blood cells to the infection sites. Once they arrive, they downregulate the phagocytic response of these cells and a whole bunch of other mechanisms that allow white blood cells to gobble up the bacteria. So all these armies of white blood cells are delivered to the site of the infection, don't do anything to control the inflammation, and then they die. White blood cells only have a three-day lifespan. So at the end of the three days, apoptosis, the cell pops, and all of those enzymes inside the white blood cell that were supposed to have been used up digesting bacteria are released out on our own tissues. So in effect, we self-digest our own epithelium from the influx of the white blood cells in their death. So that's called passive destruction. The other type of destruction is active, where the body's uh, T-cells basically screaming bloody murder to the infection control center, saying, I don't care how many white blood cells you sent. There's still an inflammation here. Do something about it. So the body dutifully ramps up the production of white blood cells and attempts to find a way to get more and more of them to the site of the inflammation. How do you do that? You build a better roadway. How do you build a better roadway? There's already tissue there. you got to knock down that tissue to build more capillaries. So the body begins breaking down through an active process, the connective tissue and the, uh, well, connective tissue, I misspoke when I said capillaries. It breaks down the connective tissue to provide the physical space for a denser capillary network to deliver more white blood cells to the infection site. And that only amplifies the first problem of the passive destruction, too, because now you have an even bigger influx of white blood cells to the site that don't do anything, die, and release their enzymes on the tissue. So if unresolved in 7 to 10 days, we get the upregulation of the influx of the white blood cells and the downregulation of over a 1,000 T-cell genes. Wow. I mean, that's stunning that these bacteria can do that. And I'm just repeating myself here. So everything that I said is, is documented on the slides for you, which, by the way, you can download from the IAOMT site, this entire lecture, so you can review it again at your own pace. Now, compare what we know to the traditional clinical tests. And that is disclosing solutions, radiographs, pocket depth estimates, because that's all it is. It's not a measurement, it's an estimate, and bleeding on probing and the character of the tissue. Disclosing plaque indices, worthless. Because what are they staining? Super gingival plaque, biofilm. <laughs> Can't get out of the habit. Super gingival biofilms. And those are healthy. They're aerobic. They're, they're not going to be pathogenic organisms in super gingival biofilms. So who cares if they stain red or not? As a motivating tool for patients, maybe it's got some use, but that's about it. Radiographs. Radiographs are nice, but they're historical. They're not predictive. All they can tell you is that at some point in time, there's been enough damage here to result in X loss of tissue and now you have a pocket there. It tells you absolutely nothing about the likelihood of future loss of attachment. With one exception, and that is an intact lamina dura. If the lamina dura is completely intact, you are pretty confident that for the next 12 months, there's just going to be no further loss of any bone in that particular area. I'm rushing through this so that uh, we stay within the time limits here. Okay. Uh, after radiographs, pocket depth estimates. Now, why do I say they're estimates? That's because you have a periodontal probe. 
which is, by the way, the first use of it I found in the literature was 1925. That's how long we've been using periodontal probes. It was only in the 1940s that they became r routinely used in dentistry. But all of these probes were developed prior to the realization that we're dealing with an infection. Before then, it was mainly thought to be calculus that was the cause of it. And a physical irritation to the tissue was causing it to withdraw from the tooth. We now know that that's false. You can take calculus and implant it in under the skin of lab animals. And does it cause any problems, any infections? No, it doesn't. So the body can tolerate calculus perfectly well. It's only when there is a pathogenic biofilm on top of the calculus that you have a problem. And much more to the point, a periodontal pocket is not the disease. It is a sequela of the disease. It is a result of the disease process. It is not the disease itself. So what you're measuring when you measure a pocket is not disease. You're measuring historical damage to the site. And by the time that pocket is even measurable, the bone's already been lost. Remember, too, that all infections begin in shallow sites. Nobody was born with periodontal pockets. We all start off with, you know, healthy sulci, two millimeters maybe. But at some point, that gets infected and begins to deepen with the loss of the uh, attachment. So healthy sites, so-called healthy sites, are not protective. You have patients that present with nothing deeper than two millimeters in mouth. That doesn't mean they're not diseased. They could well already have an infection. Pocket depth is not related to infection. Conversely, you can have patients with six, seven millimeter pockets that are healthy. And there's no reason to do any therapy in their pockets because there's not a pathogenic flora there. And therefore, no expectation of future loss of attachment. Probing reliability. This was a classic study in the literature. They took a, a group of hygienists. Uh, this is a 19, 2009 study. I just put that picture in there to show you how antiquated this is as a concept. So each of the uh, participants got two hours training and calculus detection. They already knew how to do it, but they got another two hours each. The result made no difference. None at all. No effect on what's called personal repeatability. That's the ability of you or I to go into a pocket multiple times and come up with the same measurement. Doesn't happen. And it made no difference on interpersonal reliability. That's you going into a pocket and you going into a pocket and coming up with the same measurement. Doesn't happen. So th this notion that you're using some scientific instrument to measure pocket depth is... Pardon my French, a crock. On average, as a little piece of trivia for you, how many bacteria adhere to a probe after inserting it into an infected pocket? Here's a thought for you. A million. So, can you cross-infect teeth from infected sites to non-infected sites? Theoretically, yes. Not something I'd worry about, though, because these bacteria are well able to go from site to site on their own without any help from us. Okay, quiz. Which of these two probes is the more accurate? Probe A with two millimeter markings or probe B with one millimeter markings? Hands for probe A. About uh, two, four, seven, about eight people. Okay. Hands for probe B. Whoops, ahead of myself here. Probe B. Even fewer? That's a strange result. Okay. Wow, you guys break the uh, the norm here. Most people will vote for B because, you know, it's got finer lines on it. In fact, I already programmed that into the presentation. <laughs> well, if Pro B is more accurate because it has finer lines on it to give you a greater degree of accuracy, what if we mark them at half millimeter intervals? Would it be twice as accurate as a one millimeter probe? What if we marked it at quarter millimeter intervals? So the lines on a periodontal probe give you the illusion of accuracy, not accuracy. If you think that you can measure changes less than two millimeters, you're delusional. 
study after study has confirmed that the standard error of deviation on pocket probing measurement is about 0.6. You have to double that because it's plus or minus. So according to the Academy of Periodontology, probing depth measurements of less than two millimeters are statistically insignificant. You have to have at least a two millimeter change from visit to visit for that to be statistically significant, two millimeters. And yet we routinely mark changes of half and one millimeter on its, its, its meaningless. This just repeats what I said. Single points in time are meaningless too. Patient presents and you got, you know, a four millimeter pocket, they have disease, you've got no idea. It's only the change in depth over time that tells you whether the, uh, the changes are beneficial or not. Uh, I said 0 0.6, it's actually 0 0.8. Okay, so this was, uh, does it make any difference which kind of a probe you use? And the answer is no. Eight different probes were studied in, in this particular study. Uh, they found that it didn't matter the probe design that you were using. The critical factor was how did the operator estimate which line it was nearest to? So it's a purely subjective judgment. So, pocket depth estimates. What about bleeding on probing, the holy grail of periodontal risk assessment in the past? In the 1980s, studies, multiple studies, established the fact that bleeding on probing did not correlate with disease progression. Zero correlation. BOP at baseline in three months compared to tissue loss six and 12 months, no correlation. Why is that? Yes, inflamed tissues may bleed, but you have to ask yourself, why are they bleeding? It may be to periodontal inflammation, but it can also be to a host of other factors, confounding factors, including how hard you're probing. Turns out, does anybody, well, I've already given the answer away. The, the best probing depth is 20 grams. If you take the average periodontal probe and put it on a balance scale, guess what it weighs? Numbers right here, 20 grams. So that means if you're probing a mandibular tooth and you apply any pressure at all beyond the weight of the instrument, you're over probing. So, you know, probing forces is excessive almost always. Aspirin. Five times increase in the likelihood of bleeding if your patient is taking aspirin. Do you check that on your medical histories? It's estimated that one in three people take daily aspirin for the cardiac prevention benefits of that. So one in three of your patients may bleed on probing simply because they're taking aspirin daily. Hypertension. Almost all of the hypertension drugs, angiotensin, converting enzymes, all of those things, they increase capillary fragility. So they will bleed more easily on provocation. Oral contraceptives, same story. On average, pregnant uh, uh, or women taking oral contraceptives, 22% of them will look as if they have periodontal disease because they're bleeding more readily, when in fact they do not. So menstruation, the estriol hormone changes during menstruation, they cause greater bleeding on probing. So in summary, and I only mentioned a few of them, the number of confounding factors that can cause tissue to bleed other than periodontal disease are so numerous and so prevalent that you can't draw any conclusion about bleeding when the tissue bleeds or when it doesn't bleed. This is the scariest slide I think I have in the, in the whole deck here today. When you look at false positives, classic study by Lang in the Journal of Clinical Periodontal Disease, false positive, that's the probability that if you have bleeding of probing, but there is actually no disease. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to what percent that might be? Almost 30. So about 30% of the time when you probe and you get the tissue to bleed, there is in fact no disease because of all those confounding factors. Worse, false negatives. 
false negative is the likelihood that it doesn't bleed on a probing and the patient is, in fact, healthy. Bam. 88% of the time, that is wrong. 88, that's almost 9 in 10 times when the patient does not bleed, there could, in fact, be an infection present. So bleeding on probing as, as a risk assessment tool it isn't worth the time it takes to do. So you got to do it because of the insurance companies and you know, mandate that you do it, but as a, as a clinical decision point, worthless. Tissue character, that can be unreliable too. And according to the AAP, the presence or absence of it should only be used as a secondary information. Cannot confirm risk. So, we know that periodontal disease is an infection caused by pathogenic bacteria. And do you really think that you can diagnose infection with a notched metal stick? I mean, when was the last time you, you went into the... Oh. When was the last time you went into the ER with, you know, uh, an infection in your hand? He says, well, let me get out my notched metal stick and we'll just see how infected that is. <laughs> I mean, a physician wouldn't dream of doing something like that, but we do it routinely in dentistry. To treat an infection, you have to be able to diagnose an infection. You have to know which patients are and are not infected. So reviewing traditional tests, these are legacy tests that were developed long before we knew what we were dealing with. They were not designed to detect infections, and in fact don't, and they give us erroneous data. As in the time we moved beyond notched metal sticks and blood as diagnostic tools. I mean, you might as well be shaman. <laughs> These are the 21st century microbiological tests, and that's what we're going to discuss next. Why has the profession been so reluctant to adopt microbiological tests? Tradition. Tradition is a hard thing to break. Do I have enough time to tell my favorite story? I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> um, newlyweds. The uh, wife is cooking a roast for the first time, and she cuts off two inches off this side and two inches off that side and puts it in the oven. Husband says, honey, why are you wasting all that perfectly good meat? That's the way my mom taught me to cook a roast. So they're over at mom's and a few months later, and sure enough, mom does the same thing. Cuts two inches off this side and two inches off that side. And he says, you know, gee, you know, my wife does it, you know, your daughter, and she says, you taught her, why do you waste all that meat? Well, my pan's only this wide. <laughs> so sometimes we do things for no good reason at all, but for a simple practical reason. So we got habit, you do the same thing every day of the week and you just get entrenched in doing it. Daily routine. Here's a new word for you. Metathesiophobia. Fear of change. We all suffer from this one. So, what are the microbiological tests? Uh, we'll be talking about microscopy. And that's available from my company where the pretty much the only one that does that. Uh, Bana enzyme tests, we are the exclusive North American source for that. Uh, DNA tests, uh, those are several companies now available to do that. Uh, MicroIdent is now out of business. I'll give you the skinny on what happened. Anybody used MicroIdent? Hain, Hain Labs? Nobody? And I won't tell you the story. One person. There was a falling out between their U.S. agent and the German owners of the company, and it got into such an involved legal dispute that they just decided to dissolve the company and start over. Bacterial cultures. This was once considered to be the gold standard, um, but I think it's been supplanted now. And there's only one lab in the country now that still does that. Okie dokie. Anaerobic cultures, their advantages. They're the only test that can give you antibiotic sensitivity because while they are plating out your sample, they also plate them against little uh, tabs that have the antibiotics on them. So they can tell you exactly whether these bugs are killed by these antibiotics. All the other recommendations you see, for instance, like the DNA companies, that's just based on what the literature says. They don't actually test the bugs that you sent against the antibiotics. They can check for multiple species, typically about a dozen. Disadvantages takes two weeks 
before they can get the results. Some of the bugs don't even start growing until day 11. And uh, in the summer, of course, you have to send them overnight because they're temperature sensitive. And the last time I checked, cost about 120 bucks per sample. They cannot cultivate spirochetes. Nobody knows how to make spirochetes grow well in culture yet. But they use backup for that. At the uh, Temple University, they uh, use one of our microscopes to check for spirochetes in the samples. DNA tests, their advantages, they're certainly convenient. They can also check for multiple species. Uh, they give you antibiotic guidelines based on the literature. And they give you a very nice record form that you can insert in the, in the patient uh, chart. Disadvantages, the cost varies from $99 to $130 last time I checked. Usually takes about three or four days to get your result. Uh, I can skip this slide because they're now out of business. But my Periopath is still uh, in business, and they're the largest of the DNA companies currently doing that. Chairside microbiological tests. There are two available, Pana enzyme and microscopy. Pana test is, was developed at the University of Michigan by Dr. Walter Loesch, professor emeritus there, recently deceased. Um, it uses the fact that the three members of the red group of bacteria all share a common enzyme system. And that being a distinguishing feature, you can build a test on detecting those enzymes. So it's, it's a rapid test. It only takes five minutes to do. It's inexpensive, costs about six bucks per test. Its advantages, it can be done chair sign. The whole gizmo is about this big, about the size of two cigarette packs. As I said, five-minute results detects all three members of the red group. Mind you, it can't distinguish between them. It can't tell you which one of the red group or which members of the red group are there. It can only tell you that it's positive for at least one of those three species. But from a treatment point of view, it doesn't make any difference. If they're positive for any one of them, you'd still go ahead and treat. It's as sensitive as DNA test in comparison testing. And, of course, it's fully automated. You just spread your sample on this little uh, test card, which you'll see in a minute. And I said six. Now, the disadvantages, it only does the three species. It's conceivable that you could have an infection that didn't have one of those three, but that would be highly unusual. It's semi-quantitative in that they can estimate by the depth of the color on the test how many organisms are there. One disadvantage is it's color metric, and some people have trouble deciding how blue is blue when they see the color change on the chart. It doesn't have a written report like uh, the DNA tests do. And there is an initial equipment cost of about $400. Sensitivity. There have been more studies of the Banazyme test than any other test uh, in the literature, over uh, approximately 60 at this point in time. Comparing them against DNA, if we give DNA 100% sensitivity in detecting bugs, BANA comes in at 95.5% sensitivity, so pretty comparable. Here's how it's actually done. You use a scalar curette to get the sample. You want to get that sample from the apical third of the pocket. Why? Because the deeper down in the pocket you go, the more anaerobic it is, and that's going to favor the growth of the most pathogenic species. So the worst bacteria will be growing at the very base of the pocket, and that's where you want to get your sample. You then transfer the sample to the, to the lower pad on the test strip. Don't scrub it on because the enzyme is on the surface. You don't want to you know, scrape it off. Just lightly transfer it. Moisten the upper half with a drop of distilled water. There's a perforation, fold it, and the two pads meet, and then you stick it in the machine. That starts an automatic timing cycle of five minutes, and a little light and bell tells you it's done. And then afterwards, you, you discard the uh, lower half, and the upper half is archival. You can put that in the patient's record. And there's what it doesn't show up so well on the, pro, on the projection, but can you see there's a color change here? Okay. So you're looking for these blue color changes on a salmon-colored uh, background. 
So that would indicate a positive reaction to one of those three bugs. And you will get a, uh, uh, a chart that comes with the machine that allows you to estimate the quantities of the organisms you have. So if the test is negative, there will be no color change whatsoever. Patients in the safety zone. If it's a weekly positive test, you will see some faint blue markings across the test strip. And that equates to uh, early stages of disease. And if it's a strongly positive test, you'll see much darker coloration over a greater area of the test strip. And that we would equate to high risk. Here's an old journal titled The Dark Field Microscope in Pyorrhea and Oral Infections. You can already tell from the use of the word pyorrhea that it's an old journal. But this was actually published in 1925. And why do I put this slide in here? Because it said, at the beginning of treatment, the number of organisms in a pyoreal pocket is enormous. And they were using dark field microscopes back in those days. During the course of treatment, the spirals diminish. I'm pretty sure they're talking about spiral keats. And using dark field, healing is marked by a diminution of the bacteria. It's the same thing that we're rediscovering today we knew back in 1925. So it appears rational to apply the same conception to a pyoreal lesion as we would to any wound. Duh. <laughs> Who invented the microscope? A little bit of trivia for you. I, huh? Leeuwenhoek. Everybody says that. It turns out that's wrong. I was surprised to find that myself. So everybody credits this, this guy as it. But it turns out it's a guy called Zacharias Jansen almost a century earlier. Um, the reason Leeuwenhoek gets all the credit is he had a much more powerful instrument. Janssen's microscope could only magnify uh, about three to nine times, which isn't that much. But old uh, Van Leeuwenhoek's microscope could magnify up to 250 times. And that, by the way, is his microscope. We've come a long way, right? <laughs> Highly sophisticated instrument. Had an adjustable stage. You could turn the screw here. And what they did to look at a sample is they would stick the sample on the end of this metal spike. And there was a glass bead here uh, in that little circle. And then the operator would hold it up to the sunlight so the light would come through the glass bead and that round bead would do the magnification. So that was the original microscope. Even more interesting, in his journals, he described what he called animacules in his oral samples. He looked at his own, well, then we could call it plaque. And the first mention of what I would call chemotherapeutics, because in those days, a popular hygiene measure was to rinse your mouth out with vinegar. And what he described in his journals was this. I most often then saw with great wonder there were very many little living animacules, very prettily moving. The biggest sort bent their body in curves going forward. The second sort off time spun round like a top. We think that that's what they're talking about. And he also said, the number of these animacules in the scruff of a man's teeth are so many, I believe they exceed the number of men in the kingdom. <laughs> I just love the language. Okay, so modern microscopy. Advantages, it is chair side. Only takes a minute to do the test. Granted, it takes more to talk to the patient about the results of what you find, but the actual test is a minute. It is the only test that can detect the presence of white blood cells in the sample, and those, of course, are the inflammatory cell. It detects not just Treponema denicola, but all 57 known species of spirochetes, because you can observe singletons with a microscope, whereas, with, for instance, a DNA test, you have to have about 10,000 organisms before you reach the minimum detection point. Patient motivation. How many of you already have microscopes in the audience? Oh, my goodness, quite a lot. Well, I don't have to preach to the choir about it being a patient motivator, do I? And it's cheap. The actual cost per test, exclusive of the equipment, is about 25 cents. Disadvantages. There is a learning curve. You have to learn how to use a microscope and how to interpret the results. The initial equipment cost is about... Three to six thousand dollars. Validated? Yes. There's been lots of studies in the literature that validated as a predictive uh, test tool. 
I'll skip over these. Uh, oh, we're doing pretty good on time yet. This is one of Dr. Paul Kaiser's original uh, movies. So we've got a healthy field on the left and a disease field on the right. You don't have to be a microbiologist to see there's something wrong here on the right-hand side. For those of you with microscopes, what's the first question or statement out of a... Well, it's a question. What's the first thing a patient says when they see their sample for the first time? You got it. Yep. <laughs> it just amazes me how every patient says exactly the same thing. <laughs> okay. Um, these can be very profitable things to have in your office if you don't already have one. Most offices will charge, I'm told, approximately the equivalent of a bite wing pair of radiographs. So equate that to, uh, to what you have. The lowest fee I hear relatively recently is $20, which is dirt cheap. No patient would mind charging that. So you can do a little chart like this, and you'll have that in your copies uh, that you can download, and just experiment with the number of recalls you have uh, a week times whatever fee you choose to charge for the test and calculate your weekly and monthly income, and you will find very rapidly that uh, it generates considerable income. And that's not even mentioning the additional periodontal procedures that that patient is going to demand that you perform for them to get rid of those bugs. Come on, where are we hung up here? Okay, so these are just some average mid-range uh, incomes that are reported to us. Okay, patient motivation, hands down. There's nothing ever been invented that motivates patients to do their part in the treatment program at home as microscopy. I am not going to bore you with this part except to tell you that it exists in your notes here. I am a total nerd and I find these things Utterly fascinating, but I know most people don't, but it's there for you if you want it, exactly what phase contrast is and how it works. In effect, summarizing very quickly, it's a way of optically staining samples. They used to, the problem with uh, conventional microscopy is bacteria are transparent to light. The light just washes through it and you can hardly see anything. So in the old days, they used to use stains that blocked part of the light so you could see some contrast in the bacteria. Problem with those stains is they're all lethal. They, they kill the bacteria. So uh, Zernike's invention of the phase microscope was a revelation and he won the 1956 Nobel Prize for Physics for coming up with a way to stain living specimens optically. Now, here is a conventional bright field microscope of E. coli. And here is a face contrast image of this exact same field. So you can see the, the, the difference in the diagnostic utility of that. Are they coming for us? Okay, so I'll skip over all of Zernike's technical stuff here. Okay, how do you do it? You'll need a slide or a prep, a sample, cover glass, and or a seal. All of that stuff, with the exception of the sample, come with the microscopes. Glassware, slides. Never reuse glassware. For those of you who already have microscopes, they're, they're, you cannot re-clean them to a standard that doesn't leave a residue that will affect the next sample. Handle it by the edges so you don't get uh, anything onto the slide, of course. Avoid fingerprints or glove powder uh, going onto the slide. You need to use a particular thickness of cover glass with phase contrast. It has to be 1.2 to 1.5 thick. That doesn't mean thick. Thick is an optical measurement in the glass industry. So it's like inches or pounds or meters. It's thick. Or a prep is an artificial curricular fluid. We found out very early on that what you put on the slide to, to mount the specimen makes a huge difference in what you're likely to see. So you never want to use things like distilled water, which would be hypotonic and the cells will explode in it, or normal saline, which is way saltier than curricular fluid is, and the cells all crenate and you can't make heads or tails of what you're looking at. So this has been uh, designed to be the same pH as curricular fluid keeps them looking on the slide just the way they do in the mouth. A 
And why is that important? important? Because you want it to be isotonic, same concentration of salts inside the cells as outside. Net water flow always goes to the level of the highest concentration. So you want that net water to be moving both ways simultaneously. In a hypertonic situation, where you, you got higher salts outside the cell, the water inside the cell leaves and the cell crenates or shrinks in on itself, and all you got is this unrecognizable nubbin of stuff there. The reverse happens in hypotonic solutions, where now you have more salts inside the cell than outside, so the water goes into the cell and it explodes. So, place a drop of Orprep on a new slide. Place your sample into the drop. In the old days, people would make separate drops for different teeth that they sampled. We now realize that it really doesn't make any difference. You can pool them all into one drop because regardless of any site being positive, you're going to have to treat the whole mouth as being infected anyway because the bacteria easily translocate from one site to another. I'm warning. <laughs> Don't disrupt the samples. I, I've noticed a tendency of people when they make the samples to want to kind of scrub it into the drop, you know, mix master. Don't do that because there's information to be had by the organization of the samples on the slide. And again, you want to take it just the way you do the Banna test from the apical third of the pocket. We recommend sampling at least three teeth. Why? Just to give you a better statistical average. Conceivably, you sample one tooth. It may be the only healthy pocket in the whole patient's mouth. You know. So sampling three or so gives you a good average. Gently transfer that to the OR prep, non-disrupted. If you do want to track individual sites, you can always make individual uh, slides. So you apply the cover glass, and there we have a schematic of a drop on a slide, and you want to put your cover glass down at an angle onto the slide, and then let it flop down the rest of the way. That will trap less air underneath the slide than trying to drop it down flat. Then you turn the slide and cover glass upside down onto a paper towel, so it's now cover glass side up, and compress it. How hard you compress? That's a bit of an art form. That's really the, the only art to this whole thing. You, you want to Compress it as thin as possible to get the sharpest optics. But if you press it too hard, you create a mini vacuum under the cover glass. And as soon as you let up, air rushes in and then ruins the sample. So in general, it's about the amount of pressure if you're pushing on your fingernail to blanch it, to turn it white. Give or take a little bit more or less, depending on how thick the sample feels. Last you need to seal the slide, and or seal does that. We did a lot of research to come up with something that could seal the slide without killing the bacteria, and this was the, the final result. The advantages of using the or seal. One, you do not have the river streaming effect. When you look at an unsealed slide, the evaporation at the edge of the cover glass draws all the fluid along, and all you can see are these things whipping by, and it's hard to be sure what you're looking at. So that stops when you seal the slides. Secondly, um, it, these slides will now be alive for hours and hours, if not days and days. Once you seal them and prevent air from getting into the sample and desiccating them, they can stay alive for a long time. So you apply the OR seal by overlapping all four edges of the cover glass so that you have a continuous film all around the periphery. It turns out that the best time to look at the samples is about 20 minutes after you've prepared them. Uh, that was an accidental discovery. Uh, something about the, the, the sampling and preparation process seems to inhibit the bugs. And you can look at a fresh sample sometimes, and there doesn't seem to be any, if, if any at all, spirochetes present. And you come back to that slide 20 minutes later, and they're abundant. You know, what happened? Who swapped slides? I mean, this isn't the one I was looking at. Same slide, but they just come crawling out of the woodwork if you just let them rest for, for a little period. Um, bear in mind that when you're using a microscope, no matter how thin you try to compress it, the microscope is only going to be looking at a thin horizontal slice of your sample between the cover glass and the slide. Uh, 
So you always want to have one hand on the fine focus knob, which in effect raises and lowers the focal plane through the sample that, so you can see all the different layers that are there. Some of the bugs like to migrate to the bottom of the samples. Some of them like to be up higher up. So to get a good idea of everything there, vary the focus a little bit. So what can we find with microscopes? White blood cells, only test on the market that looks at white blood cells. Question. Uh, oil is only needed when you use a 100x objective, a magnifying 1,000 times. Less than that, the lenses are designed to be used dry without oil. So oil is only a requirement for 100x lenses. Uh, treponemos, the spirochetes, all 57 species. You can see yeasts with microscopes, which again are not tested with the other tests on the market. My favorite, trichomonads and amoebae. Both of the last are one-celled animals, not bacteria. And you can also see red blood cells, but they're not of any diagnostic significance. So we're often asked, gee, do I have to resample if it looks like heme when I come out of the pocket? And the answer is no. At the microscopic level, you'll see plenty of white red, of red blood cells, but it won't obscure anything else that you want to look at. Most likely, yeah, it is the most common of the spirochetes. Oh, oh I'm sorry, I, I answered that wrongly. PG uh, is an ob obligate uh, uh, symbiote of treponema. So you, you cannot have PG without treponema simultaneously being present. So the odds are, yeah, almost certainly. White epithelial cells, you should have some in every sample, you know, if you've gone into a pocket because they're going to slough off. So that's just an indication that, yeah, you got well in there. So repeating ourselves, low-risk biofilms, not much going on there. And I mentioned about the different types of spirochetes that you see in uh, disease. How are we doing in time? When am I supposed to finish? Four or five. Okay. Quickly then. Um, these spirochetes will organize. Now, mind you, these are individual bacteria that normally swim around by themselves. But when they get into a biofilm, they start lining up shoulder to shoulder around uh, objects in, in the sample. And I've kind of diagrammed this here. So say this is a spirochete, and you've got a sea of spirochetes here, and they will, through what's called quorum sensing, they have the ability to sense how many other spirochetes are in the neighborhood. And when they get the right number, they start upregulating genes and downregulating others and changing their whole behaviors. And doing this, they start lining up shoulder to shoulder and end to end, sometimes three or four chains deep, and moving in unison. It is the strangest thing, as if they're a, a single organism. So when you see these organized patterns of spirochetes, that's a very advanced infection. It takes a long while for them to get that organized. Uh, we can skip that. Here's what spirochetes look like. Again, these things don't project too well, but you can, this is a magnified 1000 here. This is what we call two numbers to count, TNC. For those of you without microscopes, imagine patients looking at this. sea of uh, spirochetes and some rods. There's one field coming. Here they're beginning to organize. See this wave-like pattern? That's because the individual spirochetes are all beating at the same time. They're, nothing's actually moving. It's like wind blowing on a field of wheat because they're all bending back and forth at the same time. You see this movement. Again, nothing is actually flowing right to left. They're static. They're just beating in unison. So when you see fields like that, I would treat that infection aggressively. Okay, because of time, I'm going to cut that short, and we'll go to what yeast look like, because many people uh, aren't used to looking for those in samples. So this is a typical uh, yeast arrangement. You've got a, a mother cell, and it'll put out a hypha, these, these long tubes. When they're in the bud form, you may not recognize them uh, without those long hypha, but the tip off here is they look a little bit like a white blood cell, but about uh, half to a third the size of a white blood cell. And unlike white blood cells that have those distinctive trilobe nucleus inside the cell, there is none of that inside yeast buds.
And here is nice picture of yeast hypha. That's a live action shot. They're not very modal. My favorite bug of all time, the trepanemon or uh, trichomonad. <laughs> I, coined a, I coined a new word, I think. Um, very similar to the same organism that causes vaginitis. And this is what they look like. I get calls all the time from clinicians saying, I've seen something weird in my microscope. You know, what is it? Send me, send me a little video. And sure enough, it's usually a trichomonad, one-celled animal. I swear to heaven, if these things were as big as a collie, I would buy one as a pet. <laughs> here you've got an amoeba, of course, and here we're magnified a thousand times. Okay, cutting that short. Hello. Amoebae, most of you have probably seen these in, in school. No mystery about what they look like. Here's three gigantic amoebae. These circular things you see inside, dead white blood cells. That seems to be amoebae's favorite food in the world. They would rather go after dead white blood cells than anything else. They're really a scavenger. They're just out there taking advantage of all the death and destruction. White blood cells, again, the, the predominant type we see are the PMN cells with a trilobe nucleus, sometimes four lobes. Red blood cells, not diagnostically significant. Let's skip over those. Uh, studies in the literature, I just picked out a few here showing the, the, the confluence of numbers of white blood cells with disease. Obviously, they're the inflammatory cell. There's what one looks like at high magnification. Those little dancing dots you see in white blood cells, we field a lot of questions about those. Those are not bacteria. Those are the little bags of digestive enzymes. They're called cytoplasmic granules. So a fresh white blood cell on the scene will be full of those little dancing dots. And as the cell ages over three days, there will be progressively fewer of them. I'll skip over this. Suffice it to say that one exception to the rule of lots of white blood cells equaling disease is uh, hygienists. Typically, hygienists will be TNC for white blood cells, no spirochetes, of course. What's happening is all that trauma from, you know, 15 times a day brushing and flossing scrapes the epithelium, and that triggers uh, uh, an enzymatic response that results in pulling in white blood cells to police the damage. And these diagrams just go over how that happens for you. Again, we don't need to worry about red blood cells. Last question, trivia quiz. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to what this bug is? It's dentally relevant, but not for periodontal disease. Let's uh, give you a clue. This is a, uh, an electron microscope. Can't see it with a, uh, a phase microscope. It is H. pylorus. This is the bug that causes ulcers. And I only mention that because the mouth is the second largest reservoir of H. pylori. So at the same time you're doing good hygiene to prevent periodontal disease, you could be doing your patient a favor by reducing their odds of having ulcers as well. And any questions? We have come to the end. Congratulations, you asked the only one that appears. <laughs> Nobody else has any questions? Okie dokie, I thank you for coming. <laughs>